Anthony Melchiori, great to see you. I don't know about you, but I've got a great post-election hangover. Happy Friday. I'm Anthony. Welcome to No Vacancy Lives. That's my friend Glenn. You're watching the number one show in hospitality. Hey, hey, everybody. Welcome to No Vacancy Live. I, of course, am Glenn Hausman. If you've got the one, the only, the incredible Mr. Anthony Melchiori right by me in another city. But hey, how are you doing, my friend? <laughs> so good, buddy. So um, it's the day after the election. We still don't know who's president. It seems That's like right. uh, Gore Bush all over again. Um, and um, I would imagine we're not going to know until probably after the Supreme Court gets involved because it'll be contested. So yeah. I'm thinking January 4th, we'll know who the president is. Uh, we'll, we'll find out. It'll eventually uh, work itself out. I just hope we don't have to worry about hanging chads anymore. I'm still trying <laughs> to get past that from uh, the year 2000. But I got to tell you, uh, Anthony, um, there is some good news out there. Right behind me, I am not at the Baja Mar Resort today in the Bahamas because they announced that they are reopening up on December 17th. And uh, additionally, I think that's a really good um, a sign of things to come. Our friend uh, over at uh, Nolan, Christy White, is saying that meetings business has actually increased in the last 60 days by 168%. Of course, maybe the number is a little low, but that's good. That's good signs. Things are happening. That's great. You know what else is happening? Good news. Maritza is going to be excited. She'll get the first copy of it. Uh, I have my first draft of my book. Nice. Excellent. Well, I can't wait to see it. I'm very excited. Well, wh wh what do you think if we... Um, take like a little couple of paragraphs out of the book over a period of time and just kind of read a couple of the excerpts of the book. What do you think about that? I think that's a great idea. And I think it could be the basis of a good conversation. I got to tell you, Anthony, we have so many amazing guests, but we've got to do some more shows, just you and me talking about the issues that matter and really getting, um, giving advice to the folks that are out there. Cause you've got all of those decades of experience and it's a shame we don't share it in a one-on-one -on -one kind of basis enough. We should do that. And yeah. uh, I'm really, I'm really excited about the first draft. Uh, John Walcott, who's my uh, co-author, uh, is an amazing guy, and uh, he sent me the first draft last night. We've been working on it for about six months, and um, it's uh, it's exciting to finally have it all together. And I printed it out last night, and I'm going through it and editing it. And um, uh, I will send you uh, a copy, my friend. I can't wait to see it. I can't wait to read it. I know it's going to be great. The only thing that I don't like is I probably won't be able to sleep because I'm going to stay up all night reading that thing. <laughs> no, you need to have a competition to name the uh, the title of the book because right now it's personal branding book, and I have a couple of names, but my uh, co-author doesn't like one of the names. And the first uh, name is uh, of the book is "Get Your Head Out of Your Effing Butthole," and that's probably not a good name. Uh, hey, hold on, we got uh, Jim Alderman, CEO of Radisson, over here. Hope prognost prognostications of our penny recovery are currently as wrong as the polls were for Florida <laughs> and Texas. Jim, you're absolutely right. Jim, and hey, well man, what was that? I said, well said, Jim. Yeah, and uh, hey, Jim, we got to get you back uh, on here. I know you guys had said you needed a few weeks, but that was like a couple of months ago. So I'll reach out to your uh, your team and see about getting you uh, back on. But yeah, uh, yeah, let's bring our guests in. We're gonna we're gonna talk. Um, uh, we need to have some new bring in guest theme, but until then, let me just say, we've got a guest. All right, here we go. Boom. Michael Schindler hey. returning to the show. So great to see you, sir. I got to hey, tell you, man, every time you're on this show, we have such great conversation. That's why he's become a regular guest here on a no vacancy live. Great to see you. First question is for you. How are you feeling when it comes to the hospitality industry in this weird period with not really having a clear result on what's happening here in the United States when it comes to our presidency? I think the result is, uh, is, has been foreshadowed. It, it, it looks as if we're going to have a uh, split Congress and a new president. Um, I think that financially that's probably something that delivers a moder moderation to the rest of the world, uh, mm -hmm. a little bit more of normalcy in terms of, uh, personal experience and the, the way the approach to the presidency. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that anything that's too crazy, the Senate is probably going to put a kibosh on. So it's going to have to be cooperative if we're going to have another stimulus package, one that actually helps our industry that uh, has been hurt so badly. Um, from a hotel perspective, I am not the most optimistic guy out there. Uh, I just think that 
until we really know what's going on with the vaccine, till we really get a sense of how effective it is. Corporate travel is, not, is barely existent. I flew a couple of weeks ago, a uh, week and a half ago for the first time on business mm-hmm. um, recently and felt reasonably comfortable. The airlines did a, did a good job. Um, but I think, you know, the next thing to take up is a stimulus package. It's hard to say how a lame duck presidency with the existing Congress is going to deal with it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think it's something that a new president on January 20th would be pushing forward. But then we have a Republican House, uh, Senate rather, that is probably going to be, uh, you know, they were against the half a billion dollar package in some respects, whether they're going to look at a, they won't look at a $3 trillion package. I'm hopeful that whatever it comes up to, it'll probably be someplace in between. And I hope it addresses the hotel industry. Yeah, I certainly hope so too. Anthony? Getting back to your corporate travel. When you go into the airport, I've had this experience, you see another corporate travel, it's like one or two in the whole airport. Don't you feel like, like a kinship? You're like, hey, I remember you. You're a corporate traveler. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> well, I don't I, I don't wear much of a I don't wear a tie too often anymore. So I'm not sure anybody takes me for being the corporate traveler. And I wore both a mask and a shield. And I felt like I must have looked like a, a, a teenage mutant ninja turtle or something uh, and wore that most of the time. So uh, I just wanted to get to my seat. I wanted not to bother anybody. Uh, fortunately, the flights weren't so long that I had to get up and walk through the aisles uh, and just uh, hope that I could stay clean. So, okay, so let me give you an example. Um, there is a project, $70 million invested, $70 million construction <laughs> loan. You might get me, right? <laughs> what project is this you're talking about here? <laughs> so, so, $70 million uh, bought the hotel, it's done, renovating it, need a $70 million construction loan. Michael Schindler is going to get me that $70 million construction show, uh, construction loan. True or false? False. Oh, you suck. Why? <laughs> <laughs> All right. We'd like to thank Michael for being on the show today. <laughs> Bye, guys. Um, well, if there's really $70 million of equity in it. Yes. And the person's prepared to provide further guarantees of that $70 million, Yes. We might be able to find that that loan, uh, but it's going to be subject to what's the market, what's going on in the market, what is truly a realistic projection for the market, and was it really worth the seventy million they paid for it in the first place, or is that a post-COVID valuation? No, no, it's pre-COVID evaluation, but it, it it's actually uh, as, as far as I'm concerned, it's uh, uh, um, they got a great price because they had to go to they, they got a good price then I think you're going to have guarantees and you're going to have probably a two-year funded post-construction debt service reserve, maybe even three. It's going to be expensive. Yeah, two but points. It might, it might be doable with the right sponsor guaranteeing things. Two points and 7%. Two points. Well, that's that doesn't surprise me. I'm talking about the operating covenants, how much money is going to have to be put up once it opens in order to cover the ramp up of the property and so forth and to protect the lender against uh, a recurrence of lockdowns. Okie dokie. All right. So let's talk about a really good subject that makes me happy. Um, All right. What would be a good, uh, what would be a good subject that would make you uh, happy there? Um, How about, um, how about, uh, since we're talking about Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, let's see. uh, We've got, we've got this. (laughs) <laughs> so, where, where, where are we with um where are we with um if i'm a owner and i'm in forbearance i'm in special services um and i have a 200 room hotel you know side of I- 70 probably have a um probably have a brand i'm managing it myself what does the next six months look like for me Again, I think part of it depends on the market. It depends on when your forbearance expires and whether your special servicer or your lender feels pressure to foreclose uh, and get paid. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're seeing we're seeing lenders whose maturities have come and gone or are about to come and go during these forbearance periods getting a little bit antsy 
even though we believe the CARES Act allowed them to modify the loan before the end of this year without having any regulator issues. We're looking into that a little bit. But I think those whose loans have matured are getting a little trigger happy and probably will be starting to file foreclosures soon enough that it could be painful for you. Why Why can't they wait longer? What is the impetus to hurry things around now when if they think about having to resell that uh, that product, it may come in at a much lower value than it would have six, eight months ago? Uh, well, I think the lenders are more concerned about whether the value you can get for it today is going to cover their loan. So right. I think it's not the same way that you would look at it as an equity investor. You got to mm -hmm. look at it as a percentage of recovery. And those lenders, I, the ones who will not get their full face amount on their loan, those are the ones that I don't know why they're in a hurry. Uh, and I can't, I, I don't have a good explanation because with the slowdown in the court systems, the length of time it's going to take to go through a foreclosure process, the potential for a bankruptcy, particularly in a single asset, single entity borrower that could tie things up for even longer. I'm not sure I understand what they're doing other than trying to put some pressure on the borrower to come up with a solution um, because I don't think their remedy is anywhere in sight. Uh, it, I suppose if they, if they want, if they truly want to take ownership, they could push because the single asset, single borrower, single entity borrower probably doesn't have a whole lot of money to throw at the bank. So they might as well send them the keys. Jingle mail. So let me so so let me uh, change up a little bit. Budgets are being done right now. I don't know how people are budgeting or forecasting for next year because it's going to be difficult to to really see what's going to happen. Um, in January, when real estate taxes get reevaluated, what does that look like? Because you're going to what? How do we know the value of a hotel when this is such a moment in time that may all of a sudden be wiped away by this time next year? Or maybe it's going to be lingering. Maybe next year we have the best year we've ever had. Maybe next year is going to be the worst year we've ever had. How do we uh, compensate for that? Well, to, to answer your first part of the question, since that was quite a compound question, um, the tax issue is not just a tax issue. It's also a strict recovery of, of debt issue. Every receiver, every special servicer, every lender is looking to someone to give them the proverbial broker's opinion of value. And I think it's a bit of a crapshoot right now in terms of, is it a, you know, can you legitimately say it's 20% down, it's 25% down, it's 35% down, is it 50% down? So those of us in the space that are trying to do lender advisory, restructuring, receiverships are sort of struggling a little bit with that because all the metrics we've ever used are sort of thrown out the window, right? Um, so you've got that problem. From a real estate tax perspective, you've already seen all these governmental bodies losing money this year for a variety of reasons. The larger ones, states and federal governments, and this is across borders, it's true in Canada with the provincial governments and the federal government there as well. They're printing money like there's no tomorrow. Uh, our government is printing money and has printed money, although there's no more stimulus going on. Uh, but likely we'll start doing that again. Um, and, but, but the states, local governments are all at operating at huge deficits. So now you've got a situation where taxes need to be reassessed and what were, fly, what were properties flying high, hotels and other forms of real estate flying high, those guys now seem to be in the same boat. And every reassessment is going to be challenged. I just saw something in the Chicago papers last week that the Trump Tower was uh, assessed and the taxes would be over a million dollars. Uh, I'm a little surprised that that amount is all they're talking about right now. But I guess because the condos there, each individual owner has to pay his own taxes. Right. But every owner is going to go in and, con and contest their real estate taxes. You know, there's right. a cottage industry in, in most states where there are lawyers or tax provider services that go in and say, look, we'll do this and we only take a percentage of what we save you. So mm -hmm. nobody's got an outlay. You're really not harmed 
by challenging your real estate tax. Right. So, I know that you definitely should be doing that. And that's something that we're going to be focused on a lot after January 1 of this year, because it's so important for us to give everybody those tools that they need. And this is going to be an interesting way to help make up for that deficit that you may be experiencing by having fewer guests come in and being able to charge less per room per, per night. But uh, Michael, a lot of this is again, sounding like the, uh, the have the have nots, who has the, uh, who has the patience to sit things out. But when it comes to buying hotels, we keep hearing all this money has been sitting on the sideline. I swear for the last 10 years, all I've been hearing is there's a lot of money sitting on the sideline. What does it actually come into play? What is it going to take to people to pull the trigger? We've seen the ultimate highs. Now we're seeing the ultimate lows. What is going on? that there always seems to be so many so many people skittish about putting in their money. I think there's a lot of quiet conversations going on right now, but until the special services start doing things like starting to take their properties back, until the properties are truly available for sale, mm -hmm. you're not going to see all that money coming in. There has been rescue capital of various types, and there are a whole bunch of people out there who put up on their LinkedIn page on a daily basis come to us, we have rescue capital, mm -hmm. but nobody knows where the bottom is. And that rescue capital is very expensive. And I think a lot of sponsors are looking and saying, does it make sense for me to hold on for the old hope certificate that the rescue capital gets after that gives me after I say any new money is going to get an 18 to 20% annual yield before I get a penny out of it? Is it worth it for me to stay in there and hang in? And so I just think that until the special services and the lenders start taking more action against delinquent or defaulted borrowers, that we're not going to see that huge onslaught of transactional work. Um, you, you may have seen, by the way, that the largest single asset CMBS loan has been removed from special servicing and gone back to the master service. I did not see that. The Trumpo did it late September. It was a $975 million loan, the biggest single uh, CMBS uh, loan. And it appears that the uh, that the SOFRs and their lenders worked out a deal. And apparently it looked like a pretty rational deal. What hotel is that? The Fountain Hall in Miami Beach. Okay. So that so, took almost a billion dollars out of the uh, amounts in special services. Wow. So how could you explain then what this actually means practically for the owners of the property going forward and what the expectations are of the, the, the lending institutions to get their money back? In terms of the phone bill specifically? Yeah, yeah. It's, well, it's an interesting like, deal, and I think it'd be a good model for us to learn how all of this works. And, and, and to add to that, Michael, because you're such a smart guy, does the uh, rules that Florida has basically opening everything up and it being on the water, being in Miami, has that kind of gotten everybody's attention? Say, oh, our occupancies went up, our average rate's gone up, Florida's kind of open even though the cases are going up. So you know what? We may be able to, to do something here. How does that play into it? So there you go. I well, in the first place, all I know about it is what has been reported. I don't have any uh, uh, particular insights. Well, you're, you're you're ahead of us on that one. <laughs> um, but what I saw is that they eliminated the debt service covenants for 20 and 21. They required them to go back and start putting up their FF and E reserve again. Okay, Michael, I'm going to stop you for a second. Debt service covenants. Explain to people that may be not at your level what that means. Uh, debt service government is the is the hook that a lender will provide that says if you're not producing income in excess of your debt by a certain percentage, let's use for the sake of argument, uh, twenty percent. It could be less. It could be a little more, depending on the circumstances. But what happens is that if you are not maintaining a net income to debt service ratio of 120% or 125%, whatever is agreed, then the lender has the ability to declare a default. So that going forward, they have waived any requirement to maintain a debt service coverage, obviously for 2020, because nobody would hit it. And as I understand it, for 2021 as well. They have asked 
the borrower to reinstate making FF&E reserve deposits. And I suspect there was some money paid down on the mortgage. Mm -hmm. Whether, I, I think the borrower would look at Florida and, and the special circumstances in Florida that you described, Anthony, as reason to move forward, possibly even to pay down some of the debt. Um, but again, the Fountain Blow is a really unusual case because they had done in, I think, three years out of the last four, that is 19, 18, 17, 16, they had actually done an initial financing and then two refinancings for increasingly more money, which presumably was taken out and distributed to the investors in the project or to themselves. So they were in some respects, based on my best guess on the arithmetic, playing with house money. So let me so ask they had to write a check back for 50 million. It wasn't, oh my God, we have to dig into our shorts for 50 million. It was, oh, we got 152 years ago. So we're giving some of that back. And this may be a silly question, but I really don't know the answer to this. The Fountain Blue is a legend. The Fountain Blue is iconic. Um, what the value of the brand itself, say that it doesn't have a building, and just the value of the name, the Fountain Blue, does that play into kind of basically taking out of special services and having faith that the Fountain Blue's name is big enough to kind of recover faster than maybe other properties? I think it certainly it goes to the, to the uh, ability to project that when things start to recover, the Fountain Blue is going to be on the cutting edge of that recovery. I mean, it's a beautiful property, and they have done a great job of putting money back into it and restoring the old Ted Lapidus design and, and adding when they needed to add. So you can't take away from its iconic stature. Whether the special servicer looks at that that objectively, maybe on that deal, uh, maybe they would do it on the plaza. Maybe they would do it on the uh, on well, the uh, Beverly Wilshire, the, you know, the, the true iconic hotels in this country. Uh, and, and they would take that into account. Whether it entered into their financial underpinnings and, and analysis, that's a tough one. I don't know. Yeah, it's just a curious question because, you know, there, there's a lot go, there's a lot of play. And I want to kind of show the audience that it's this is an area where it's five years ago, it's cut, it's cut and dry, it's black and white, it is what it is. You don't like it, we're moving on. This is where we need all of the brain power to come together to make reasonable decisions on everybody's behalf. And to, I don't think anyone's going to come in and, for lack of a better term, be a disciplinarian and say, this is the way it's going to be. I think everything has got to be thrown in the, mi the mixer and, and, uh, and, and where's the less pain, you know, because everybody's going to feel pain on this deal. I think that's truer in the CMBS situation than it might be in some of the local banks uh -huh. because local banks feel more pain. I mean, they, they already see it. If, if this hotel is not paying its debt service and that hotel is not paying its debt service and th that starts to get into their investment in the hotel space, they're going to feel more pain. They're going to be less likely to look at that overarching big picture right. and say, well, you know, the found blow is going to be on the cutting edge of recovery. And um, as a result, we can play with it longer. That's not going to be true for the Hampton off the highway in, in West Suburban Chicago or the Fairfield off the highway in the West Suburban Chicago. Um, because that's a much more, it's bricks, it's mortar, it's brand because you're paying for the, Ham the Hilton brand or the Marriott brand or whichever. And that sort of goes without saying that you're getting, it. Um, you know, and the, and the brand gets a comfort letter with the lender right. uh, that protects it if it if the lender takes it over. So, and, 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 you know, one of the things I also want to say for anybody that's out there and I'm not, you know, you're not paying us. There's no sponsorship here, but having somebody on your team like you is so critical. It's like just listening to you. I've learned so much. I got a master's degree in 20 minutes. It's it's so vitally it could important. be longer than that. Yeah. It costs a whole lot more too. I'm sure. More people, right? As you get all that, it's so critically important to have you sitting at the table, even if you're not able to do something or get a loan or whatever. Just advisement is so critically important because 
you know the percentages. You know the house. You know you you know how the house works, right? So so you're the inside. You're the inside pit boss in a casino. You understand. Don't play that game. Play this game. And that is so critically important right now. Right now, information is gold. That's my business. I mean, that's I mean, you've just described my niche in the business. Every time you come around, I fall more in love with you, Michael. Yeah, I know. And, and while we're talking about casinos, don't play roulette. The best deal in the house is behind the pass line on the craps table. So just so everybody knows that. So, Michael, when it comes to these special servicers, I think um, they're they are they are biased, right? They're not down the middle type of people. They're more to take care of the banks need the lenders need than the ownership group is that correct and if so correct. That's how job. does that how does that affect potential outcomes for hoteliers that may have gotten them into uh, into trouble with the CMBS situation well i think the ones that have limited hope of recovery they they don't have any money this is the only hotel in this entity um I think those guys are going to be uh, either forced to bankrupt their property, send the keys back because the special services aren't. And technically, they're supposed to be. They're not uh, They're not going to be emotional about it. They're supposed to be dispassionate. And their jobs are to maximize the recovery for the tranche of owners in the entire CMBS package. Um, there are those who say that the special servicers make their money when these types of things happen and therefore they're going to be even harder to deal with. I find that those types of accusations are probably more true in the anecdote than they are in real life. And somebody looks at it and, you know, somebody in a special servicer may have said some, look, you know, this is, this is our time to make money. And everybody thinks that therefore it applies against everything. I like to think that there's a little bit more objectivity to it, but dispassionate objectivity. They're not going to feel sorry for Anthony because he's so handsome. So six months ago, when you were looking, or six weeks ago, when you were looking at this, when you were on our show, um, I was still handsome back then. I'm more handsome now. I understand that. But besides that, do I you- I don't know how you keep doing it. It's amazing. Do you think, you know, the more weight I lose, the bigger my ears look. But do you, um, are you, are you, are we where you thought we would be? Are we in better shape, worse shape from six weeks ago? Or are we where you thought we would be? Uh, I think I have, I have personally become a little more pessimistic. Um, but that's because we are seeing the surge that we don't know what impact that's going to have. Could this lead to a further, another lockdown where, the airlines stop, you know, hotels are reclosing. Um, and some of these forbearances, people might be starting to come out of them. Maybe they're paying interest now, but not paying principal. Maybe they're supposed to start paying principal soon. And if all of a sudden there's no cash to do that, we're going to be sort of back in the soup. So I'm, I, I'm having trouble seeing that 2021 is going to be some great year as I sit here and starting to look at budgets, starting to see that nobody has a, a, the right idea of when things are going to open up. Um, and so that's my biggest concern. Well, well then if they open up, and you, even if they open up, then we're still talking about a confidence issue and whether or not companies want to spend the money to put people back on the road. So, precisely, precisely. yeah. Where are the Pebble Brooks and the Blackstones right now? I, I think they, I mean, you've seen, I think, unfortunately, um, Ashford and Braemar have been out sort of there as the poster child for the for the REITs, but they're giving properties back. I haven't heard much about uh, Pebblebrook uh, as, a, as an entity giving properties back, but I suspect that all of those guys are quietly, they're, they're certainly analyzing every one of the properties in the portfolio. Sunstone has basically washed its hands at the Hilton Times Square. Yep. Uh, uh, a very complex transaction. Forgetting the CMBS, it is a complex transaction. What does that mean washing their hands? What does that mean? They basically told everyone that they are no longer going to support the property, whether it's the security, right. the maintenance, uh, and so on. Is that they're pretty much done with? So well, why would they do that? Yeah. They they owe more than the property's worth, probably, probably, and they've already lost a bunch of equity in their REIT. 
Right. And now to maintain the property while it goes through the workout, it goes through uh, any of the remedial stuff that the special servicer would put in place. They're just, you know, to pay the security. Remember, we have we have union union security, union people who have to go upstairs and make run the elevators every day. It's going to cost twenty million just to open it up. And Sunstone isn't going to put. That's bad. That's good money after bad. Right. So, so I think that all of the REITs probably have something in their portfolios that they're dealing with. Uh, the good news is that. They have really smart people running those companies. They have really smart asset management folks. They got really smart uh, acquisition and development folks. And they're they're the ones that get their phone calls returned from the servicers. So there are a lot of these people who don't. Do you think that there's um, going to be sunshine raining down that hotel uh, in the next year, meaning someone's going to come in and see a great deal and hopefully put it back in business? Or you think it's going to be vacant for a couple, three thousand years? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, you know, tell me what's happening Even in New York City. Tell me what's going to happen in New York City for the next six months. Okay, this is what's going to happen. I have no idea. Uh, right. I, I will tell you, we got to get rid of the gentleman that's the, the mayor, and he's going to be leaving soon. So we got to get rid of him. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Well, you know, he's, and he's, he's the, one really the, city. the one politician I can talk about without anybody criticizing me because nobody likes I know. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, so uh, that's why we like to we're, have a daily segment, Bash de Blasio. But um, I will tell you, um, um, Michael, it's a very, very complex situation that we are all dealing with right now. And it is impossible to figure something out. We were teasing about the, the chat on the, uh, the, the budgets. And, you know, the UK is going into lockdown tomorrow. A lot of Europe is starting to go into lockdown t um, this week. I personally, based on what I've seen, um, with political rhetoric, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think we're headed in that direction. When you have states like Florida saying we're not going to do anything anymore, I don't think we're going to lock down. I'm not saying people are going to travel. I'm not saying that it's going to be a panacea, but I do believe that uh, things will stay in this mode for a, a while. But when it comes to budgeting, not knowing a darn thing, how do you even plan how much you should be spending? What is the thought process that you go through with? Not the amount of dollars you're going to allocate to each column, but how do you even kind of put everything into perspective to even think about trying to put dollars in a column that may or may not mean anything? Let me take let me take a shot at that and tell me if I'm yeah. right. All right, pretty, cool. Pretty quick. If I was an operator right now and I was the owner operator or either or – I would say we're spending zero dollars period this year. That's it. We got the asset we got and we've mm -hmm. got to make it work and we're not spending a penny on capital. We're not spending, we're not renovating a damn room. I'm not buying a can of paint because I don't know what's going on right now. The hotel is mediocre. That's okay for now. But right now my job is to save the hotel and to save as many jobs as possible. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not spending a penny. I, I think that, our approach to looking at that has been any capital needed from your manager has to show a demonstrable return on investment. We're not doing capital for the sake of capital. Uh, that is particularly interesting because every major brand suspended capital requirements for the remainder of 2020 on or about the 15th of March. Mm -hmm. which means all the 2020 capital, I think I've talked about this on the show before, all the 2020 capital that was not spent, you could at least argue from the brand's perspective, and this is particularly true when the brand is your operator, right. that, gee, you would started to do all this stuff a year ago, surely you will come in and do it this year. And my response to that, although we're not quite at the point where I'm prepared to respond to any of this, my response is, I'm going to do it only if you tell me it's going to make me uh, a, a real return on investment. And if it's just done because it is a brand standard and it should have been done last year or even the year before. Right. I'm not sure I'm very sympathetic to that. But, well, Besides, I don't, I, don't may, I may not have the capital. Where am I going to get the capital? I, I, I think I, I, these, owners, these owners have spent all their money just to maintain their properties, to pay some people. You know, we, we had one PPP set of loans. Most of that money's gone. There has been, as we know, no further subsidy, no further supplement or stimulus for our business in the in anything coming out of Congress. And 
we don't know where that capital is coming from. So if somebody gave gave me a million dollar capital budget, a half a million dollar capital budget, regardless of the size of the hotel, one of my responses may be, where the hell am I getting that money? So I wouldn't have started with capital to answer Glenn's question, but that is a that is on the list of things that I would start with. You know, I I'm, think making sure we're right sizing, you don't have one employee more than you absolutely critically need. Some of your folks may be on furlough or on a temporary assignment or doing stuff. And you, you say, look, the likelihood of bringing you back full time right now is slim. If you can stay on furlough, whatever the deal is you have to make to keep them on furlough and say, look, maybe there's a shadow shift. Maybe there's a shift you can do. We'll get you a shadow schedule going forward or we'll stay in touch with you on a regular basis as to whether we may need you back because Glenn and Anthony bring their traveling circus to our hotel for a week. Mm -hmm. um, you got to, it, it's got to be right sized and you got to make sure that what you've been doing, particularly for the hotels that were closed and had to make sure the elevators were running and the toilets were flushed and the water was running through the pipe and the heat was working and the air conditioning was working and so forth. You know what it took to operate with no business. Now, as business starts to return, even if it's 20% or 25% or if you're approaching some operational break even, you don't want to go crazy and say, okay, well, I hit 30%. That means next month I'll do 50%. Right. That whole ramp up thing no longer exists. Right, because so, we don't know what's going to be happening tomorrow, and demand today might be gone tomorrow, depending on the individual situations. For example, in New York, we're changing, um, you know, Governor Cuomo changed the, the rules for if you're coming to New York, uh, New York State, what you have to do in order to be able to go out and be in public. So if these things keep changing, that's going to get people skittish to travel. Michael, I got a question for you. Let's say that um, Mitch and Nancy and Donald call you up and they said, hey, Michael, we want you to create the best package possible for hotels. What can we do to help stimulate them and save their businesses? What would be included in that package? A vaccine. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's my brother-in-law's business, not my business. Um, <laughs> um, I think... One of the things we've seen in Canada that has really worked very well, and uh, I know that this administration anyway is not good at looking at what other people do and saying it might work here. Mm -hmm. I think it's also what's been done in Europe. I think Europe has done much more direct subsidy to individuals. Right. We tried the PPP program. Uh, Canada has got a program that effectively is a wage subsidy. So we can hire people. and. Even if they're furloughed, they can be paid as if they were working a subsidy, but we pay, we process it. So we pay the subsidy, government gives it back to us. It's probably a month, three week, four week mm -hmm. lag in terms of getting reimbursed. But when the government promises you, they're really not so bad at writing those checks. So I think that for employment and people's sanity, um, I think that a subsidy that looks as if it is taking care of employees first and foremost. Right. Um, I don't think that either the unemployment supplement that was paid out, but then expired, I think at the end of July, or even the PPP program, which was a good idea, but I don't know that that was intent. It's certainly not intended as a long-term thing. Right. Uh, I mean, I got a PPP loan. I used it in the eight weeks that was originally allotted. And uh, I'm waiting for my bank to tell me what I need to do to have it forgiven. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think the first thing would be something that helps the employees of our hotels, uh, even before we help the owners. And I know that, uh, you know, uh, that may not be the best thing, but I think we've got to help the people that are making 12, 14, 15, 18 bucks an hour who are truly worried about where their next grocery yeah, store is coming from. Yeah, I will say, I will say, Michael, in uh, Europe, and I was uh, fortunate enough to recently have hosted Best Western's annual event. So I spoke to a lot of their uh, CEO leaders from around the world, and I'm forgetting which countries in particular, but some of them were paying um, former employees that are on furlough 
as much as 80% of their full-time salary, which really cuts to exactly what you're saying right there. Take care of those people in a real way so they could pay their rent, they could eat their food. And I think in a lot of instances, that goes a lot of way to keep propelling the economy forward because they'll be spending that money and putting it back into the system. I haven't, I, I, I agree. I, I think that I haven't quite figured out how to deal with the, the Blackstones and the Pebble Brooks and these guys. They're very sophisticated, but ultimately all of them have investors. This is not just John Gray and Steve That's Schwartzman right. sitting in their tower making right. all this money. Yes, they are very right. well compensated. And yes, and they, John Gray they, runs a Blackstone for those of you who don't know. Mm -hmm. Right. And Schwartzman is the chairman of Blackstone. So, mm -hmm. but they have investors and you, you look at who their investors are, their university endowments and their right, yeah. municipal mu municipalities right. and pension funds right, and the right, like, right. who ultimately have obligations to the people whom they're supporting. So it's not as it, it, it's tough to have sympathy because nobody's going to do a garage sale for Steve Schwartzman. Right. However, it's what he's representing and where those funds are coming from, uh, which is, by the way, where. I probably am unlike a usual Democrat. I actually understand that people in corporations do create jobs. Um, um, right. But so so I I don't know how you deal with the big picture, the ownership, and where right. their loans are going bad. Not for anything they did, but because people weren't traveling and and they were just spending money. I mean, when you're when you look at the hotels how much money they were spending just to maintain their buildings, to maintain minimal staffs, skeletal staffs in some cases, while they were closed, they were still losing money hand over fist right. because there were costs involved right. in dealing with that, that operation. And where was that money coming from? Right. And this is a very complex situation because you're right about things like those pension funds. And I don't think the typical American sees it that way. They see it maybe as a competition between the line workers and the perceived millionaires out there. But if the pension funds can't get their money back, then how is my mom going to get the pension she worked so hard for as an educator for 30 years? How is she then going to be able to pay her bills? So you're right. This is a, there's a lot more levels to this than it really appears to be. Yeah, and I'm not sure, no matter how smart I might think I am, I'm definitely not smart enough to solve this problem and get something that at the same time we know we can push through uh, a Democratic House of Representatives and a Republican Senate and have it signed by whomever the president might be. Right, right. Yeah, interesting. Anthony? I think right now the anxiety around the world, not only in America, is really playing into a lot of what's happening. So the number one thing that people are concerned about is will they pay their mortgage this month? Will they have enough money for a Christmas or Hanukkah present this month? And everything else, I think they're just closing their eyes and saying, I can't control that. At least if you want to hold on to your mental health, I think that that's really important is don't worry about what's happening or not happening out there. It's like just stay focused. And I wanted to kind of go back to what you talked about. Uh, and I didn't mean to interrupt you. Uh, I was trying to get it out. And I think right now the worst sentence in the hospitality industry is because it's a brand standard. That's why you have to invest. And right. I think if, 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 if I think the brands have kind of been, you know, pushed into submission at this point, whereas the owners are in, you know, in charge. And at the end of the day, they're just trying to keep the lights on. If anybody came to me and say, because it's a brand standard, I think that that would be a very difficult place to be. And I think the brands not being able to bring a lot of their corporate people back and a lot of their regional people back, I think they don't really have a leg to stand on. So it'll be really interesting in the next three or four months to see how much leverage the owners really continue to not only have, but have for a long period of time. I think because this is going on for such a period of time, I think that those changes and that strength coming back to the owners a little bit is going to be here for a couple of years. I don't think once everything gets back to normal that it's going to be a brand down kind of uh, focus anymore. I think the owners are going to have a real say. Well, I think that pendulum has swung back and forth in our industry for years. Right. So there have been times when the brands have been paramount. There have been times when the owners are paramount. Right now, the challenge with what you just said, Anthony, is that the owners just don't have the money. 
And I, it, it, 10 years ago, I wrote an article that I, uh, and I called, uh, you remember, you know, the stories about kids who came home from school and there was mom and dad were working and there was nobody home. The Lat kid had to let themselves in. Latch latchkey key, kids. I, I wrote an article about latchkey hotels because you didn't have an owner who had any money. You had a brand that was operating a hotel and it wanted to maintain the hotel according to its brand standard, of course, and be proud of that hotel. And there was no one home. The lender wasn't putting money forward. The owner was basically, uh, you know, sipping pina coladas at the uh, local swimming pool. And the brand was worried about maintaining brand standards. But the fact is, it was a latch key hotel. There was no one home. Right. Mm -hmm. And my fear is that there are going to be owners who just won't put up with it anymore. They don't have the money. They got to deal with what they have as opposed right. to what they don't have. And they're going to walk away. And whether it's the brand or the managers, the third party managers will not have a problem walking away. Mm -hmm. The brand's name is up on the door. So they're going to be worried about how right. that affects them. So I think we may be going into a, a, a climate where we have latchkey hotels again. Yeah. And you know what I feel bad for? I feel bad for the general manager who is going through this holding on, cleaning the toilet bowls, holding the hotel together, hoping that it stays and then it doesn't. And then where are they going to go for a job? Because, you know, it's, they're few and far between right now. So that general manager, right. you know, and the one thing I would say to that general manager is take the emotion out of it. Take that I work so hard and this isn't fair and just say, hey, this is the way it is and do your job and don't get so emotionally invested in your job right now. May, this is a job and you've got to get it through and take care of your employees. But so many general managers and so many uh, uh, supervisors in this business get so emotionally invested and then they don't know the financial ramifications of what's happening. And then all of a sudden that hotel is either closed or, or somebody else is taking over and they feel crushed because, you know, they're emotionally invested that, you know, that's just a side note, but I think that that's really important. Although, Glenn, this is being recorded, right? Because I don't yes. think you would ever say that, Anthony. I mean, look at you. You are emotionally invested in what you do. You want your general managers to be emotionally invested. Yeah. And yet you're trying to say, shut that valve off for right now. And I'm I'm not sure that general managers are a class of people who can turn that valve off. You have to. And I'll, and I'll tell you. Um, you have to, because that's the only way you're going to get up in the morning. If you are, if you realize the one thing as a general manager that we don't do a good job of is we don't realize we're business people. We're entrepreneurs. That's who we are. Okay. We're not human resources directors. We're not rah-rah people. We're not cheerleaders. That is part of our business. That is who I am at my core outside, the, outside of my, uh, uh, responsibility to the bottom line. But I am very, when I was so emotionally involved, I was also really, really good at understanding that this is a business and I am not going to take the wins and losses personally. And I think that is critically important mm -hmm. if you're going to be an entrepreneur and a business person. Forget about general manager. So you're right. I agree with that, but it's paramount right now. And that doesn't mean you're going to give any less. If, if anything, you're going to give more. You're going to be more focused on it as a business and less as you know, I just love this business. The, you know, we got to get rid of the the, the, the the inspiration and get back to the discipline of what we do. And the discipline of what we do is we save businesses. And if you don't have the mindset of saving a business, then you're going to get confused. And th that's what I'm saying. So, yes, we are emotional people, me being on top of the list. But at the end of the day, I am 100% a business person that looks at the bottom line. And that makes my decisions, not my heart. But that's an objectivity born of maturity. Um, you know, the, I haven't called you mature, Michael. I didn't call you mature. I said you have some maturity. Um, <laughs> but, but the first or second time GM, who is 32, 33, 34 years old, is not going to be able to step, step back and get to 5,000 feet and look down at the situation right. and do what you've just described. And well, that's so, why I'm saying it, because I've been there and I've seen people crushed crushed it's like oh my god i didn't do enough or they're not fair this isn't about fair this is about i say it all the time hotels run based on the investment deal that is made mm -hmm. period end of story the only way we can have fun and the only way we can be motivated is to understand the investment deal understand how the numbers play out once you understand how the numbers play out and whether you're in charge of those numbers 
I'll give you the perfect example. I have a good friend. There was business he took over. The number just didn't make any sense to me. No matter how much he tried, no matter how good he was, it didn't work. Okay. And I knew that day one. Okay. But it's not my place to say anything. So if you don't know the numbers and if you don't know how that's shaking out, then, you know, you, like that's the problem. You know, that's the problem. You know, that most general managers don't ask those questions. So what I'm saying is I agree with you a billion percent. That's why I said that. And I kind of I decided to kind of go off on a little bit of a tangent because people are forgetting about the general managers. And I, I want them to understand is like you have to take care of yourself and mentally and physically you have to take care of yourself and understand to get this hotel across the finish line. You've got to concentrate on the financials and you've got to concentrate on the business, not on um, the rah-rah. This is not a time for rah-rah. Fair enough. Yeah. One last thing that I wanted to say before we uh, we wrap up today is I got to tell you, we talk a lot about the hotel owners and we talk a lot about the brands, but when you suspend doing any work on your hotels that are brand mandated, the ones who are getting it, in the you know what, or it's our wonderful vendor community out there. And I got to tell you, we don't spend enough time worrying about what they're up to. They're under a lot of pressure right now because it's easy for uh, owners and brands to make those decisions. But the ones who are affected most are our friends out there that are trying to make a living selling into to hotels. Any perspective on that, Michael? Well, I think I, th I think that's one of those things. And it, it would be on my list of uh, budget items to look for is that you got to tell the folks in the hotels that they have to look at every service contract, every vendor contract. And some of those people are going to suffer yep. because their contract, their service is not mandatory. It's a, That's it's right. a nice to have, but not a got to have. And as a result, there are going to be hotels that are terminating service contracts with that community. And of course, those fine folks have families to feed as well and employees to pay. Mm -hmm. So, this is not a, there's no binary aspect to this problem. Um, you know, even when you look at the big bad CMBS guys or the bank lenders, they have people that they're responsible for too. That's right. If they're not getting paid interest or they're not getting paid their principal. They can't then put it back out in the community. That whole scene from It's a Wonderful Life at the bank when there's the run on the bank, this money is circulating. And so this isn't good for anybody. I mean, right. This is lose, 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 not win, win, win. Yeah. yeah. And that's why I think the, the mental aspect of the game is really critical right now of don't look at the ghost. Don't look at what could be. Look at what's in front of you from your business perspective, your personal perspective, and manage what's in front of you. I think what I see around me, whether it be friends, family, or business associates, a lot of people are looking um, at the boogeyman. And the boogeyman may show up and it may get real freaking bad, but wasting your energy and your time and your stress on the boogeyman is um, a waste of energy. And uh, and I say that from personal experience because I talk myself into that every single day to stop worrying about the boogeyman. Um, every single one of us, if we're not doing that, then the boogeyman is going to get us. So right now it's about really – uh, X's and O's, and we can't control. We voted. We can't control what's happening. Uh, we we put our businesses out there. We can't control what's going to happen with the vaccine. We just have to be able to to be there when things turn around, and that's the key. And things will turn around. Yeah, Agreed. absolutely. Michael Schindler, Four Corners Advisors. Any final words from you, sir? Uh, I, I I hope my uh, my uh, pe pessimism is overstated. Um, I hope that we do get a vaccine soon. Um, uh, I will take a vaccine um, subject to the footnote that truly my brother-in-law will have to tell me that it's okay because mm -hmm. that's his business. And yep. I, um, I, I hope that this spike stops and I hope we can rationalize our government before January 4th. Yeah. Yep. The spike won't stop. It just won't because the way things are going right now, we just got to make really good decisions. Um, and right now, if you do close the economy because the spike's going up, I think we're going to be devastated. On the other hand, we've got to control. The only thing we can do is control ourselves. So the biggest news I got out of this entire conversation, Michael, is no one's taking the vaccine until we hear from your brother-in-law. Well, I'm not. <laughs> and I'm going... 
Uh, I'm also putting pressure on him to tell me. Right. Kind of time is- and where's he think? If you don't mind saying, like, are we close? Are we January, February? We haven't had that conversation. His right. the last thing I saw of him, and particularly publicly, was sort of the. Uh, shutting down of the uh, vaccine office in the pandemic, uh, uh, the, the concern about following what happens with the vaccine. So if you get a shot and three days later, you have this really splitting headache, you don't want to attribute the headache to the vaccine. There used to be an office that followed that. It was all consolidated into HHS, and it's unclear whether that office actually still exists. So Right. Yep. All right. Michael, thank you so much for being here. And you know you've earned a chance to come back again in another uh, look forward month to or so. Thank you so much. Thanks, really, really appreciate you. Man, I got to tell you, I've really become a big fan of Michael Schindler. I always liked him, but now I I think I'm in love. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm one uh, fan club member. I love that man. Yeah. Um, because, like, he talks he talks facts, and I'm a fact guy, man. I don't want to get into the weeds. I just want to know facts. Facts, man, facts. So, uh, Michael right. – invited i love you and you're amazing and i will probably be calling you for some uh advisement on and and i will say i'm uh, getting into the weed is not always a bad thing so don't worry about that little uh little pot you were there for you now that uh new jersey uh legalized um uh, oregon uh, uh <laughs> oregon went ahead and they legalized uh uh hallucinogenics like um uh like mushrooms can you believe that that's a that's pretty crazy. Yeah, well, if you listen to Joe Rogan, he thinks it should be legalized everywhere. Listen, I'm not – listen, I think it, 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 alcohol is legal. That should be legal. I'm not a guy that's going to take it because it's legal. Um, just like I don't overdrink because it's legal. I don't smoke cigarettes because it's legal. So I think – Freedom listen, of choice. Freedom of choice, man. I mean, you're 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 able to you know jump out of a plane. Why can't you be able to smoke a joint? That's know? right. Not, yeah, I won't do it, but why can't you do it? Yeah, I don't know. I haven't uh, I haven't tried shrooms since the 1990s, and I don't think it's going to be coming around anytime. Maybe after retirement and stuff like that, but not, no, not great show for any of that stuff. But uh, yeah. another great show, my brother. Um, I, I'm mixing it up. Uh, who's on the show tomorrow? I do not remember who's on the show. Oh yeah, we got. Uh, I remember now. We've got uh, we've got Cecil State and the CEO of Ahoa. He's going to come on very shortly at the beginning of the show to talk about his perspective on what's going on at the election and what it means for the hospitality industry. I also expect Chris Green. He'll be back. And then we've got some folks from J.D. Power talking about the best management companies out there and what's going on at the uh, the airport. So very full show. And on Friday, Anthony, we're going to have a, uh, a special pre-recorded bonus show. So it won't be a best of. It'll be all new content even though uh, Anthony and I won't be hosting it live that day. So it should be a lot of fun. This week, if everything goes according to plan, we'll be in Washington, D.C. And then the following week, I'll be with my good friends at Cintas, and I guess I will do the podcast from there. Yep. And then um, I will be hopefully in Vegas, my friend. Yeah, excellent. All right, everybody, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate and love that you're tuned in with us uh, every single day. Do us a favor, share this with a friend, subscribe to our newsletter, text the word hotel to 66866. But please help us get the word out. We could use your help with all of that. And finally, no matter what's going on, remember, you got to make the best of it because you've only got one life. So blaze on and go to